All parties must adhere to dialogue and negotiations to resolve disputes through peaceful means. China reiterates its call for a negotiated settlement to the conflict in Ukraine. Plus, amid global uncertainty, Beijing outlines modest economic goals for the year. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. A global pandemic, rising inflation and a conflict in Ukraine are just some of the issues impacting policy decisions. At this year's opening of the National People's Congress, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang outlined the country's economic priorities for the year. We'll have more on that later in the program. But we begin with Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi's virtual press conference on the sidelines of the NPC in Beijing. CGTN's Li Jianhua has more in this report. Every year at the political season, the press conference with Chinese Foreign Minister uh, is considered a highlight. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi took nearly 30 questions from reporters. Wang answered questions uh, about China's foreign policy and diplomatic relations. And we have to say this is one of the very rare opportunities that reporters from around the world get to ask the Foreign Minister questions about China's stance on international issues. And this time, unsurprisingly, questions related to the Ukraine crisis were the most asked. The first of five questions were about China's stance on the current situation. Uh, and about the Ukraine crisis, uh, Wang said China hopes the third round of talks can bring progress. Rationality is needed now to find a solution to the current crisis. And China proposes initiatives to avoid humanitarian crisis. China-U.S. relations were brought up for sure. One said the U.S. needs to put verbal assurances into practice. And a major country competition is not the right choice. And both sides should work to push China-U.S. relations onto the right trajectory. And of course, China-Europe relations were touched upon. Trade volumes uh, reached 800 billion U.S. dollars in 2021. The number of freight trains commuting between Europe and China stood at 15,000 last year. And China sees Europe as a very important trade partner. On Taiwan issue in particular, Wang pointed out that the Taiwan question differs in nature from Ukraine issue and the scheme to use Taiwan to contain China is doomed to fail. On global governance, Wang said developing countries now will participate more in global governance and Asia's time has come. Given that many international meetings will be held in Asia this year, uh, there are also some other issues about China's relations with ASEAN, Japan, South Korea, Central Asia, India, uh, South Pacific nations, Africa and Latin America. All in all, we can see that China would like to shoulder more responsibilities when it comes to global governance, uh, maintaining world stability and safeguarding global economic recovery. Li Jianhua, CGTN, Beijing. There is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Martin Jacques is a global affairs commentator and author of the bestseller When China Rules the World. Saurabh Gupta is a resident senior fellow at the Institute for China America Studies. Also with us is John Gong. He's an economics professor at the University of International Business and Economics. And Victor Gao is a current affairs commentator and chair professor at Suchow University. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Victor, a big focus, as we just heard, on Ukraine, understandably, at uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's news conference. Let's listen to part of what he had to say. All parties must adhere to dialogue and negotiations to resolve disputes through peaceful means. They must focus on the long-term stability of the region and establish a balanced, effective and sustainable European security mechanism. Solving complex problems requires calmness and rationality rather than fanning the flames and exacerbating the conflict. China believes that in order to resolve the current crisis, we must adhere to the aims and principles of the UN Charter and respect and protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. So, Victor, this war is escalating. We are now in the second week of this conflict. Uh, what, if you, what, what, do you, uh, what is your opinion on what has happened so far, and what are the chances of a negotiated settlement soon? Thank you very much for having me. First of all, mankind is never as close to a nuclear holocaust as we are right now. So this is not child's play. This is very, very serious. 
Secondly, the war in Ukraine, which is conventional by nature right now, has the possibility of escalating out of control into nuclear warfare. Russia has said on many occasions that it is putting its nuclear weapons on high alert, and the United States does not tell you, but it has already put its uh, nuclear weapons on high alert. So we are talking about a chance for miscalculation or misreading of intention on each other's side, and this is truly leading to a holocaust, if nothing else is taken right now. Then we are talking about energy crisis in Europe and in the United States. We are talking about more than 1.0 million Ukrainians fleeing their country, impacting on many neighboring countries. So let us do the right thing. And I think China is a voice of rationality, and China urges all parties to de-escalate and engage in diplomacy at a time when there are major countries which are keeping stimulating the situation as if the disaster is not enough, as if losses of life are not sufficient right now, as if, for example, we are not as close to nuclear brink as possible. So I think China now sounds like a great statesman, sounds like a great philosopher. China is talking not only about today, but about 10 days, 100 days, one year, 10 year, down into the future. And China wants to see peace being recreated and sanity restored. So this is the main message of uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi in his press conference. And I hope his words will be heeded by all the parties involved, directly as well as indirectly. Let's make peace rather than war. Let's let the Ukrainian people live in peace and safety rather than in desperation and in fleeing their country. Right. Victor, we did hear the foreign minister tell us that uh, the talks that are taking place now between the Ukrainians and the Russians uh, are in their third phase. There's three rounds of talks that have taken place. Do you see a mediation role for China at some stage? I hope so. Why? Because the conflict is not just between uh, Russia on the one hand and Ukraine on the other hand. Behind Ukraine, you see the clear shadows of the United States and NATO member states. So in a sense, Russia on the one hand and the United States and NATO are already in this very clear rivalry. Now, Russia and the United States and NATO members cannot talk to each other in any meaningful way. And China has good relations with Russia on the one hand and with Ukraine on the other hand. And China is one of the permanent member states of the United Nations Security Council, the second largest economy in the world. So what China will do will be very impactful. And China does not have a side to pick. China stands for peace and has been urging dialogue from the very beginning of the outbreak of the conflict. Right. So I do hope China has a role to play going forward. Martin Jacques, uh, we have not talked in a long time. Great to have you back on the show. Um, firstly, let me ask you for your opinion on what is happening in Central Europe right now, how we got here and where you see this going. Well, first of all, uh, it's very good to be back uh, after a, bre a long break working on my book. But, uh, well, I think this is, uh, I agree with a lot of what Victor said. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, a very dangerous situation. Um, you know, this is the unraveling of uh, 30 years of history after the uh, disintegration of the uh, Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it's now, uh, it, it's, it is in a, a profound sense out of control. Um, the war is going on. It's lasting longer than I think uh, a lot of people thought it would go on for. Uh, and there's no sign, no prospect at the moment of any peace. Uh, because the both sides are determined to fight. This is an absolute tragedy for the Ukrainian uh, people. Um, I think that, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the questions uh, in relationship to this, I personally don't agree with what Russia did in terms of its uh, use of military action, but uh, it obviously felt deeply uh, pressed uh, by the way in which uh, uh, NATO expansion had proceeded more or less uh, to the Russian border over a long period, encouraged by 
uh, the United States and, 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 to a lesser extent, other European countries. Um, and that's how we, I think, have got uh, uh, to this situation. The question is, uh, how can it be brought to an end? Because if it's not brought to an end, it could escalate in a very dangerous fashion. Um, and I think uh, China is, uh, could play an absolutely critical role, a historic role in this situation. Um, I mean, if you have a mediator, the mediator's got to be agreeable to both parties. And China is in probably about the only country, I think it is the only country, uh, that is on friendly terms with both Russia uh, and with the Ukraine. Of course, the Ukraine is a very important element in the Belt and Road program. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that if China can uh, uh, could play this role, it's very important. I noticed Wang Yi today said, uh, in, in his press conference, said uh, that China could be, and Ch China offers itself to be the mediator in this situation. This is very important. That's right, and China is actually offering humanitarian assistance as well. Sarab Gupta, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, also discussed the growing China-Russia relationship and said that Russia is China's, quote, most important strategic partner. Let's listen. The development of China-Russia relations has clear historical logic and strong internal dynamics. The friendship between the two peoples is rock solid, and the prospects for cooperation between the two sides are very promising. China and Russia are each other's most important close neighbors and strategic partners. The China-Russia relationship is one of the most critical bilateral relationships in the world. Our cooperation not only brings benefits and prosperity to the two peoples, but also benefits world peace, stability and development. I'd like to stress that the China-Russia relationship is independent and self-reliant. It's built on the basis of non-alignment, non-confrontation and non-targeting of third parties. And they're not subject to interference and provocation by third parties. So, Sarah, what do you make of that geopolitical relationship to, in terms of Ukraine and beyond? Well, I think just as you heard, the the, the relationship between Russia and China is is strong, and it is a very important pillar for both countries. And in international relations, when your friend is down, you don't stab your friend in the back. You tell your friend very clearly where they went wrong, and I think China, Russia has done some very wrong things, frankly, and with China, which doesn't sit comfortably with China, particularly the violation of the territorial integrity of a of what was a, a totally peaceful state. Uh, but that, having been said, uh, international relations will not end at the end of this decade. It'll go on, and one and Russia is a permanent is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. This is a relationship that China has built very arduously over the past 30 years. This is one of the pillars of the of international society. And I would see uh, China playing it low-key at this point of time, but doing it in ways that doesn't scupper this relationship, because I think there are a lot of advantages to be gained over the long term via this relationship. And as we've had this discussion, the discussion with the previous speakers, it also enhances the space for China to be some sort of a facilitator or even a mediator at some point of time uh, uh, in, in, in this present conflict if, if its services are so called upon. John Gong, of course, China has always <coughs> championed a stable world. Now, at the National People's Congress, uh, there's been an emphasis on job stability, managing risk, um, I mean, these are high priorities for China. But how is this ongoing Ukraine crisis going to impact the country's goals? Well, I guess um, the coming out of this um, work report, government work report, is probably um, you know caught Chinese government off guard by the uh, uh, this development in Ukraine. Um, it certainly has an impact. It has an impact in the sense that uh, it, you know it dramatically impact the commodity prices worldwide. It dramatically impact, I would say, um, China's exports, import, trade area. Uh, you know, so so uh, I think definitely it has an impact. But I want to also address this question about uh, you know China's stance on this. I, I you know I, I want to also emphasize that um, you know different countries have different perspective on this war going on. Um, but I think um, China is actually not so much really uh, alone in my view uh, in terms of uh, taking this position. I mean China is on the side of uh, quite a few countries. Uh, all the BRAC countries, for example, 
uh, India, Brazil, um, they pretty, pretty much on the same, uh, take the same position, Pakistan as well. Uh, I mean, it's a, if you look at the, the total population of these countries, it's really not the minority. You know, economic-wise, uh, I think there's a statement from the European Union saying that uh, the countries that are so united against Russia in this case um, stand for more than 50% you know, of world GDP. Yes, it's more standing more than 50% of GDP, but in terms of number of people, uh, in terms of number of mouses that speak up, um, the majority is actually resting with the, uh, the countries uh, such as uh, India, China, Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, and a host of other countries. Victor, during his news conference, Foreign Minister Wang He talked about getting the United States-China relationship back on track. And the United States, we know, will soon begin a review uh, on the first group of tariffs. That's on more than $300 billion worth of Chinese imports. And that review is required to prevent its expiration. Um, given the turn of events in Ukraine and the fact that the United States and China might be both moving towards resolving this. I mean, do you see an opening for China and the U.S. to find common ground on other issues as well? Well, first of all, China-U.S. relations are the most important bilateral relations in the world of today. And uh, uh, it is strategic, it is economic, it is trade, it's people to people, you name it. It's very, very comprehensive. And China-U.S. trade volume is also one of the highest in the whole world. It used to be the largest as far as China is concerned. Now it ranks lower than China ASEAN trade, China EU trade, for example. I personally hope the bilateral trade between China and the United States can be further increased from the current level all the way to about one trillion level. And the additional amount to be added to China-US trade need to be exported more by the United States to China. So economic relations are there. The uh, bilateral relations are very, very important, and the people-to-people -people exchanges are huge. So China-U.S. relations are very different from U.S.-Russia relations, and any further damage to China-U.S. relations will be mutually destructive. It's bad for China, but it's also bad for the United States. The tariffs the United States has been leveling are not paid by the Chinese government or the Chinese people. They are paid by the American consumers, and it fuels the inflation that is felt very acutely by the American people. Now, on the other hand, allow me to mention one thing further, and it is exactly like what Wang Yi said yesterday. That is, China does not want to be an enemy of the United States, and the Chinese people are not enemies of the American people. So I hope Washington will really get this right. China is not an adversary or an enemy. We can get along with each other, even though we are different. And the differences can enrich both of us, rather than tearing us apart. This is a moment of truth. And it will be very bad for the United States to be fighting Russia on the one hand, and fighting China on the other hand, and threatening to sanction countries like India for refusing to sanction Russia. Each country is independent. Each country has its own independence of mind in terms of foreign policy. The world will be much better. And the American interest can be much more enhanced if China and the United States get along. Let's, again, get along with each other rather than get into each other's jugular. What do you think, Martin? Is there something of a window of an opportunity here for an improvement in relations between these two countries? Uh, well, I'd certainly like to think so. Uh, I'm personally not optimistic about this. I mean, one's always looking and hoping that perhaps there'll be a bit of a crack uh, in the American position um, and a, a willingness to reach out to China in a slightly different way. But really, so far, there's been very little sign of this. Now, could this present crisis uh, help in this regard? I mean, at the moment, it's going in exactly the opposite direction, uh, I think, because uh, at the moment, I mean, the, at the moment, the Americans are, you know, really gung-ho uh, about the war and encouraging uh, 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 the, uh, the fighting and so on. So I, I, I just don't, I don't see it. I mean, the other thing also to observe here, I mean, there's so many things that we don't know you know, this, this war, war could unleash lots of things which we, we don't yet fully understand or comprehend. Um, 
But one thing that it has done is really consolidate the relationship between the United States and Europe. I, I, I don't think we should underestimate that. Uh, we haven't spoken about it so far. Uh, but really what's happened is a big shift in German foreign policy, for example. And Germany has been a very important player, not just in relationship uh, to uh, Russia, but also in its relationship with China. Now, I don't necessarily think the two are connected. I don't necessarily think Germany will now have a different attitude towards um, uh, towards China. But, uh, you know, this has unleashed new forces uh, in Europe, uh, which are not at the moment uh, uh, very encouraging. Um, so I think that, that uh, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of things in the air at the moment which we don't know the consequences of. I mean, you know, let me just throw in another one while we're talking about this, and that is, I mean, the economic impact of this war on Europe because of the huge increase in commodity prices and uh, the cost of sanctions and so on. I mean, you know, the situ economic situation in my own country, Britain, uh, it, we're facing a big, big rise in the cost of living. Uh, something we haven't seen on this scale for a very, very long time. And this is going to impact on other European countries as well. So I think that that's, a, that's part of the wider uh, background, if you like, uh, of what this war could mean if it goes on and if there's no resolution in the reasonably near future. John Gong, getting back to China, uh, Premier Li Keqing, he laid out China's economic goals uh, over the weekend. Uh, he was cautious. He warned that there are risks and there are challenges. Let's uh, listen to some of what he had to say. The risks and challenges faced by our country's development this year have increased significantly, and we must climb the slopes and overcome the hurdles. The main expected goals for development this year are GDP growth of about 5.5 percent, more than 11 million new jobs in urban areas, an urban unemployment rate of no more than 5.5 percent, a consumer price index at about 3 percent, growth in personal income that is in step with economic growth, steady growth in import and export volume, and a balance of domestic and international payments. So, John, that growth target of 5.5 percent, that's uh, pretty modest. and. Uh, Premier Li also warned that there are risks, uh, that the economic recovery is still very shaky, that commodity prices are still too high. But what are some of the domestic challenges that China faces? Uh, uh, well, I, I know, I, you are, first of all, let me say that it's about 5.5 percent. I think that uh, uh, the government is leaving some room that uh, the rate can be you know, less than 5.5 percent. Second, I think it, it's not a moral number. I think it's a, it's a, it's a quite uh, a tall order, actually. It's, it's a big challenge, in my view. Uh, you know, the fourth quarter last year is less than 5 percent. And the, 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 the first two months of this year, uh, which is terrible, uh, very much impacted by uh, the outbreaks of the viruses uh, almost a lot of, in a lot of places in China, Chinese cities. And, and even today, you know, we've seen news that it's popping up again in Beijing. Uh, and certainly this is going to um, impact the economy, uh, impact the service sectors, uh, given China's continued you know, zero tolerance policy. So, uh, so I think it's a tall order, actually. Um, and, and I think um, the, the Probably, you know, what the government is doing is, is really release the, uh, the, you know, the power of the, uh, the monetary and, and the fiscal policies, uh, especially the fiscal policies. I think oh, we're going to see a lot of expenditures, a lot of uh, continued expenditures, investments on, um, on, on infrastructure, uh, the soft side of infrastructures. Uh, I think this is the government's game plan here, uh, that uh, it's, it's relying on um, the, the fiscal policy uh, trying to stimulate the economy again. Um, but again, let me emphasize that um, it, it, it's not easy. Um, and also, if you look at the, the list, uh, that list of objectives, uh, the targets, uh, some of the other things are quite, also quite challenging. 11 million people, um, employment created. Uh, and that's a, you know, last year, I think it was less than 11 million, but, you know, this is also a, quite a challenge. Um, inflation uh, kept uh, below uh, five percent. I, I heard uh, again. You know, you look at the the, the commodity prices. Look at the uh, oil price. I mean, people are talking about over two hundred dollars per barrel. 
Um, and you know that you know, energy prices drive up everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and China's a big importer of energy uh, products, uh, oil and gas. So, um, so I think, uh, again, that's a big challenge. Um, I, I, I hope uh, um, the you know, uh, Premier Li Keqiang's uh, administration can put it off. But uh, I wish him all well for that. But uh, I think it's a big challenge. A lot of things need to be done. So, Gupta, what do you think? Is that a little bit too ambitious, 5.5 percent? Uh, yes, I think it is on the ambitious side. I think uh, observers were thinking it would be around 5 percent would have been the target, but I think he's deliberately put, the Prime Minister, the Premier has pushed it up uh, to be a little bit more ambitious, especially on growth. Uh, uh, where I see China going in this regard in terms of its economic targets is, yes, the, I think monetary policy will remain prudent. It will be supportive, but not, not go off the charts. I think there will be fiscal stimulus. It will not be the old type of fiscal stimulus in terms of local government bonds, et cetera. It's going to be kind of using the surpluses that SOEs have and use that for spending. There are going to be tax cuts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think the larger fundamental issues that China is facing, which need to be faced, and I think it's high time to face this, you know, we have the property sector, uh, which is dragging down growth. And, and at some point of time, China needs to kick this addiction of uh, fixed, invest, uh, fixed investment uh, to, to, to drive its growth. And at the same time, another area where China needs to provide greater focus on is in supporting consumption. Uh, the stimulus packages which were provided during co the COVID uh, times were primarily on the supply side, not on not towards demand, and and consumers require support, and that's why it's good to hear things about uh, about things like child rearing, about yeah. births, about making houses more houses affordable houses available, and we'll need to see where China goes on that front. So I think the focus is on little greater growth, but right. primarily on stability too. Victor Garb, I've only got about a minute left, but um, China also announced that it will be spending 7.1% more on defense this year. So put that into context for us. What does that mean? Thank you very much. Uh, the, Chinese economy, the Chinese defense forces are the second largest in size next only to the United States. Uh, on the other hand, China faces much more national security challenges beyond its shore and beyond its border and the international situation is becoming more challenging and more uncertain. China, as a sovereign country, has the right to beef up its defense capacities in order to deal with whatever threat that may surface. And uh, this is very much in light of what China is doing right now, the size of its economy, the challenges in security right. sense faces, as well as the tasks that okay. we need to engage in. Peace. Okay. Defending peace. Thank you. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Knight. I'm in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.